Great. So um, I want to pick up where we left off yesterday. So last time, uh, where did we leave off yesterday? So last time, what we were talking about was how vial fermions are forbidden by the product of time reversal and inversion symmetry. And the reason for that is because Barry curvature vanishes in this situation. So what I wanted to talk about today is what are the types of symmetry protected band crossings that you can have with time reversal and inversion symmetry, and then more generally um, give an overview of how you would classify symmetry protected band crossings. So let's start with the first situation. So if you have time reversal and inversion symmetry, then what is allowed? Well, remember what we talked about last time. If you have inversion symmetry for every vial point at some k point, you have another vial point at the opposite k point, which has the opposite chirality. If you have time reversal symmetry, you come back to your original k point, and now you have two vials with opposite chirality at the same k point. So if you have time reversal and inversion, what you can have is two vials together. So we'll write that as like vk dot sigma minus vk dot sigma, and they have opposite chirality. In this case, so I have a particular basis in my mind, so in this case I'm going to implement the time reversal and inversion symmetry by i sigma y tau x complex, and the k is for complex conjugation. So if you have this symmetry, then clearly I can have this kind of Hamiltonian. Um, and this Hamiltonian will give me a four-band crossing. So this basically just looks like one vial point on top of another vial point. Since each one of these bands is twofold degenerate, then at this crossing point, they're fourfold degenerate. And the dispersion is linear, just like the vial dispersion. So tau. tau is just the other poly matrix here. So this is a four by four matrix. These are two by two. These are two by two. So there's another poly matrix of two by two blocks. So that's what the tau matrix is. And actually the basis, so I'll tell you because I have an example in my head that I'm thinking of. I actually have a basis in mind. Um, so the basis that I'm thinking of is motivated by cadmium arsenide. So I'll, I'll come back and say, say, I can say a little bit more about that later. But the basis that I'm thinking of is I have some orbital coming from p orbitals, which has jz equals three halves. I have an s orbital with jz equals one half. I have another s orbital with jz equals minus one half. And I have another p orbital with jz equals minus three halves. So you can see from this time reversal and inversion operator, this thing is purely off diagonal. So in other words, it mixes the p orbital and the p orbital, these things are time reverse inversion partners, and these things are time reverse inversion partners. Okay, so if you kind of go through the steps, you can see that this is actually the right operator that would correspond to these orbitals. Okay, so we can have a crossing like this, but it's not protected. Not protected. Why? What does that mean? With this symmetry, I could add a mass term. So I could add another term to the Hamiltonian, which would be like m tau x. You can see that m tau x would commute with my time reversal and inversion symmetry, because that's also tau x. So these things commute with each other. But such a mass term like this would open up a gap to my Dirac fermion. So time reversal and inversion symmetry together allows for this type of four band crossing, but it's not enough to protect it. You need an additional symmetry to protect it. Otherwise, there's other symmetry allowed terms that I can add, such as this mass term, that will open up a gap and this thing will become an insulator. And so the extra symmetry that we need is a rotation symmetry. So, so in other words, to protect a Dirac fermion, not only do you need TI, but you also need rotation symmetry. And the rotation symmetry that we're going to use is a fourfold rotation. And so this is where these J or JZ um, eigenvalues come into play. Our, our, C4, um, our C4 matrix is a four by four matrix, but each one of these states is actually an eigenvalue of fourfold rotation because precisely because they have a JZ 
um, because they have a, a JZ eigenvalue. And so this is a diagonal matrix. That's why I put the basis in this order. So it has eigenvalues, which are like e to the three pi i over four, e to the i pi over four, e to the minus i pi over four, and e to the minus three pi i over four. So this matrix um, commutes with the Hamiltonian in the following way. If I write C4, H of kx, ky, kz, C4 inverse, then I get H of ky minus kx, that's the C4 part, and the same kz. So you can check for yourself that this matrix and that Hamiltonian that I wrote above have this property. With this symmetry, that mass term is forbidden. It doesn't that, that mass term HM will, will not satisfy this symmetry. And so that mass term, as well as any other mass term that you could think of, would be forbidden by rotation symmetry. And so rotation symmetry, time reversal, and inversion all together, those are the types of symmetries that you need to protect a Dirac fermion. So that's the main message. Um, the vial fermions that we talked about yesterday are protected they don't need any symmetry to protect them. They're protected purely by topology. But Dirac fermions are different than that. They actually need symmetry to protect them. And also, they don't have the topology. They don't have a churn number. And we can I'm going to come back later to talk about, is there any topology that we should associate with them? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and he, so the question is why only C4 symmetry? Um, there's actually different symmetries that will also work. So I wanted to pick this to be concrete so you could plug this matrix into Mathematica and check for yourself. But actually, that's kind of the next thing that I wanted to say. So let me say something about material realizations. So here's the most common Dirac materials that I know. Cadmium arsenide and sodium bismuth. These are kind of the classic examples. Cadmium arsenide has C4 symmetry, sodium bismuth has C6 symmetry, so this is the same, yeah, it goes through the same way. And actually, you can understand the role that these symmetries are playing um, quite nicely, which is that basically, this is, this is a crossing of two bands, which ha what's happening is that one of these bands, say the right-moving one, has two of the C4 eigenvalues, e to the plus or minus i pi over 4, and the other one has the other two, e to the plus or minus 3 pi over 4. So... They can cross, and because they have different eigenvalues, there's no way to gap them. They have good quantum numbers. And so what you need is a rotation symmetry which has enough eigenvalues that you can make them cross with different eigenvalues. So twofold is not enough, because time reverse partners under twofold symmetry can have plus or minus i eigenvalues. So the other set also has plus or minus i. That's not good enough. But fourfold and sixfold have enough different eigenvalues that you can have symmetry protected band crossings. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, does it need to be a proper rotation? Right, so we need it to be a proper rotation because we want it to be a symmetry along this whole line. An improper rotation will only leave one point invariant, so that won't be enough to protect a crossing along a line. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So we needed we need all those things together. We need time reversal, inversion, and we need the rotation symmetries. Yeah. We're actually only using the TI together, so we could have had each one separately broken and just had the TI product. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, great. So then the next question is, uh, do Dirac fermions have Fermi arcs? And this is actually a pretty subtle question. Well, by now the answer is known. But it was subtle um, in 2015 when I was learning about vial fermions and Dirac fermions and asking people, do Dirac fermions have Fermi arcs? And they told me yes. Um, so that was the naive answer. Why would, I, why would I think yes? Well, if we go back and look at my model, it just consists of two vial points. We know that the vial fermions have Fermi arcs. I just doubled that. They're not coupled to each other. So clearly I have Fermi arcs. So in, in our simple model that I wrote down, well, the model only has one Dirac point, but there's going to be some other partner to it. In our simple model, it has Fermi arcs and it has two Fermi arcs. So I have two of these Dirac points, 
Each one is two vials. So together, they have two Fermi arcs. OK. The point is that actually, you can add more terms to the model. So my model is expanding around these Dirac points to linear order in K. But I could expand to quadratic order, to cubic order. And if I kept adding more and more terms in K, these Fermi arcs are not protected. Um, and so there's a really nice paper now that pointed this out. So, so the reference, um, the reference is Cargarian at all, PNAS 2016. If you can't find it, I can send it to you. Um, so what they showed is that if you actually add these higher order terms in the Hamiltonian, which are allowed by symmetry, um, they don't gap the Dirac points, but they gap out the Fermi arcs. And so what, what happens is that these Fermi arcs start shrinking. And so they actually get smaller. They start detaching from the end. So they still make a closed loop, but they just start shrinking. And they can shrink down and down and down. Um, and you might ask, well, can they disappear completely? Well, actually, that's kind of an interesting question as well. Um, you might what you need to do is look at the 2D plane in between these two Dirac points, the, the high symmetry plane. Um, and if that high symmetry plane is a 2D topological insulator, it needs to have surface states. And so that means that the Dirac Fermi arcs can't close completely. They'll stay some finite size, but they're just not attached to the Dirac points anymore. On the other hand, if that 2D plane is trivial, then you can actually just get rid of the Dirac, uh, you can just get rid of the Fermi arcs completely. So the answer, the final answer is no. Unlike vial fermions, Dirac points don't need to have Fermi arcs that are attached to them. Um, and the reason is because the Dirac points don't have a churn number. So there is no topological requirement to have surface states. Questions? Totally clear? Uh. My two vial points, you're asking. They are not only do they project to the same point, they're literally at the same K point. Right. So why, why did you draw them? Separately? Ah, the, that, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. So the question is, why did I draw them separately? No, this was, this was meant to be, I, I, I wasn't being clear. This is the Dirac point that we've been talking, or talking about. And this is saying that there's another Dirac point uh, that I didn't write down. Okay. That would be its time reversed partner. So, in the, for example, so if I have time reversal and inversion, which is the case that I've been talking about, then there'll be some other Dirac point. And I'm thinking about Fermi arcs connecting those two Dirac points. Thank you for asking that question. Another question in the back? Hey, uh, so I get the argument with the Dirac point not having a churn number, but then, so I, I didn't get the one with the KP theory. You're like, I mean, the KP theory doesn't know anything about the boundaries in real space, right? So. Yeah, so it's not an argument, it's just a fact. So basically, my, my KP, my K dot P theory, I can add higher order terms that are allowed by symmetry. I just, they're allowed, I can. And it's possible, and this paper shows explicitly, that there's a K-cube term that you can add to this particular model that that will cause the surface states to, to change. So, okay. so the point is, I can make a model where the Fermi arcs start detaching. So that just shows that they can detach. In any particular material, whether you have Fermi arcs or not, will depend on the precise surface termination and depend on the mis microscopic details. So it is possible to have a Dirac material that has really nice looking Fermi arcs, but the point is that they're not protected. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And it only takes one example to show that something is not protected. Uh, can we just have one Dirac point and... Uh... And, and if we just have yeah, one... Yeah, so we can't... Oh, sorry. So we can't have just one Dirac point. Um, one way... So in our most simple model here, one way to see that is because you have bands with different symmetry eigenvalues that are crossing, but the Bruin zone is periodic. So eventually those symmetry eigenvalues will hit each other. So there needs to be another Dirac point to compensate for that. Okay, thanks. Um, what what would you think that will happen if if you put rashback coupling in your in your system? So 
kx sigma y minus ky sigma x will be allowed by symmetry at some point in your... So I have a suspicion that Rashba's Minerva coupling breaks inversion symmetry. Yeah. So, so, but, mm -hmm. so in that case, you will have inversion symmetry breaking, but pg could be allowed. Or, yeah. Okay. So, so in this case, right. So I guess you could, in principle, have a system which has Rashba to break inversion and has broken time reversal, but then time reversal and inversion together could be preserved. And that system would still be allowed to have Dirac points. I don't know, I don't know if something like that, but in principle, yeah. Okay, so then the next question is, um, is there anything, are Dirac points topological? Is there anything topological left about them? Because we just showed that they don't have to have surface states. And usually when, um, when we want to think about topological systems, we want to think about having surface states. So one answer is no, because there's no churn number. Another answer is no, because there's no surface states that are required. But there are some other answers that you might argue in favor of yes. So one, one reason why you might say yes is because you can still have... Uh, some kind of transport anomalies. So this was kind of, um, for example, the stuff that Philip was talking about yesterday. Um, you can have these anomalous Lando levels that emerge. Uh, so that seems to be a, sim a signature of topology. Um, another answer why you might say yes is because you can think of Dirac points as kind of like apparent to vial fermions. So what I mean by that is if I have some Dirac fermion and I add a magnetic field, then I will split my Dirac fermion like this, and I will have vial points that come out of that. So they kind of have some intrinsic topology built into them. Um, so should we call that a topological phase, or should we not call it a topological phase? More recently, um, we have another argument why we might say yes, which is that, so yesterday I talked about how we can consider a vial point to be a critical point between two two-dimensional phases, a 2D churn insulator and a 2D trivial insulator. So if we consider our 3D system to be a stack of 2D phases and we consider, say, KZ to be a tuning parameter, then we can consider the vial point to be this critical point. So for Dirac points, there's a similar story, which is that you can consider the Dirac point to be a critical point between a higher order TI and a trivial insulator. Um, so I kind of like this story. So, so... Dirac point is a critical point between high order TI and trivial insulator. So what do I mean by that? This is kind of the same sort of picture I was drawing yesterday. If this is our Dirac point, I can consider planes on either side of it. And what always happens is that one of these planes will be a 2D higher order TI and the other one will be a trivial insulator. Now, this is why I wanted to give a lecture on higher order TIs, but we ran out of time. Um, 2D higher order TIs are protected by rotation symmetry, time reversal, and inversion symmetry. And these are the exact symmetries that protect Dirac points. And so um, if, we look along the, if we look along the rotation axis, then we have all the right symmetries to protect a higher order TI phase. Uh, so and, th and this has consequences. This actually will give us hinge states. So the 2D higher order TI, you know, if we think of a square sample, it'll have corner states, which are, which are sitting at its corners. They'll be in the middle of the gap, mid-gap corner states. Now, if we consider our Dirac material now in K space, then what happens is that we have all of these planes that have a higher order TI index, and they all have corner states. And so this will give you corner states in K space, um, hinge, hinge states, that start at the projection of one Dirac point and end at the projection of the other Dirac point. So I think it would be, I should try to draw a picture here. And so the picture is something like this. Um, if this is the, now I want to consider a sample where this is the KZ direction, and these are the real space X and Y directions. So I have some Dirac point in here. I have another Dirac point somewhere else. And these intermediate planes in here, for example, a plane like this would be, um, would be a higher order TI. And so that higher order TI plane would have corner states. The plane above it, which is also a gapped 
plane would also have corner states. The plane above that would also have corner states. It's not till I hit the other Dirac point that I get a trivial plane. And so these corner states will actually persist. They'll make hinge states, and those hinge states are going to start and end at the projection of the Dirac points onto the corners. And so we called these things higher order Fermi arcs by analogy to higher order topological insulators. And so this is described in a paper um, by Ben Weeder and company, including myself, um, a couple of years ago. And then my student, Yuan Fong, also followed up on this um, So the, in Ben Weider's case, he showed that these higher order Fermi arcs must persist if you have fourfold rotation symmetry. We then showed that this is actually a generic feature of all Dirac points. For any Dirac point, which is protected by time reversal, inversion, and any rotation. So that's either threefold, fourfold, or sixfold. As long as it's linear in all directions, then you'll always have these higher order Fermi arcs. So that gives us a kind of bulk hinge correspondence that we think... Um, uh, corresponds to the topology of the Dirac point. Um, and I just wanted to, I'll do your, answer your question in a minute. I just wanted to point out another reference, which is kind of showing a different perspective. So this is coming from um, Palab Goswami's group, where they actually showed that yesterday we talked about how a vial fermion is a source of Berry curvature. They showed that a Dirac for fermion is a source of a non-abelian SU2 um, kind of generalization of Berry curvature, which takes into account all these crystal symmetries. So there is a way that you can have a topology of a Dirac point if you take into account the crystal symmetry. And I think it's exactly the same as considering the Dirac point to be a critical point between the higher order TI and the, and the trivial phase. So anyone who can't find these references, I, I can post them in the Slack or you know anyone who's interested. Uh, I think there was a question over here in the, yeah. Um, so, um, when I, if I understand it wrong, just correct me. So, at the point of the Dirac, um, of the Dirac point, there mm -hmm. we have this trivial insulator, no? Well, so the we should we have a three D system, and I'm slicing it into planes. Yeah. So the Dirac, where the the plane containing the Dirac point is not an insulating plane. So it's neither a trivial insulator nor a higher order topological insulator. It's a semi metallic plane. Uh -huh. It's only the insulating planes below it and above it that I can assign them an insulating, you know, a topological invariant for an insulator. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like above you have the, the trivially insulator and, and yeah. when, what you colored is exactly the hot... Like, yes, uh, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, that's what okay. I meant to show by this sketch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just... So in the higher order topological insulators, do you have, since the churn number is zero, is there any other invariant that classifies them which is non-zero? Yeah, so there... There are these Wilson, like nested Wilson loop invariants. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this nested Wilson loop invariant, which is basically, um, yeah, I mean, we haven't said anything about Wilson loops, so I don't think we should say any, any more details. Okay, but we can talk about it more. Or maybe David wants to add a detail. Okay, well, then, uh, then, then you're... So in 2D, higher the eyes are abstracted. So these Fermi arcs are not protected, right? It's... Ah, I wouldn't say that they're not protected. So here, so in higher order TI, you have these mid-gap corner states, right? They don't have any spectral flow precisely because, um, precisely because the higher order TI state is kind of what we'd call an obstructed atomic limit. But they, they do correspond to an anomaly, which is that if you count the number of states in the valence band, you can take it mod four and see that it's, yeah, there's a difference between that and a trivial insulator. So there's always a way of detecting them, even if the valence band somehow kind of comes up and blocks them from your view. Okay, so, but they don't have to be in the gap, right? They can be... Right, they can be, they don't have to be in the gap. That's right. Okay, great. Um, what you call a nodal loop topological, then? Uh, would I call or, a nodal loop? Uh, what? Yeah. Well, like, yeah, I just wonder. I mean, it also it's like the same that it, you don't have like a strong bulk boundary correspondence 
right? But mm -hmm. but at least you have like if you compute the very phase through the yeah, non-loop, very you, phase it's invariant, very mm -hmm. phase. So, but you. I mean, I think this is a question of words, so okay. I'm not gonna, uh, you know, I may, maybe I didn't answer this question on purpose. There's some yeses and there's some noes, and so you can judge for yourself whether you want to call this topological or not. There's a very phase invariant that's associated with it. Um, you okay. know, in this case, this Wilson loop is like a kind of doubled Berry phase. Um, yeah, okay. I, I don't want. I don't want to make the final call on whether we should call that topological or not. Okay, thanks. And I don't know if there's. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so then the other thing that I wanted to say is, well, then maybe we can go take a step back and say, what are the different types? of symmetry protected band crossings that we can have. And right, I think based on that last question, I I also want to make the distinction because I think this distinction was blurred in the past. Not all symmetry protected band crossings need be topological. I think we should start using our vocabulary a little bit better. There might be topological band crossings and symmetry protected band crossings, and these might not all be the same as each other. And we should think more carefully if we have a band crossing and we don't have a topological invariant for it, we shouldn't just call every band crossing a topological um, a topological band crossing or a topological semi-metal. Okay, so so far. We've talked about Dirac points, which occur along a high symmetry line. And so this would be some high symmetry line um, because they require rotation symmetry to protect them. Okay. And so this, because they occur along a line, they're movable. So that means that I might add some perturbation to the Hamiltonian and the Dirac point might move along this axis, similar to how the Weyl point can move. But there's another situation that, that I haven't mentioned yet, which is that you can also have band crossings at high symmetry points. And an example of this would be, um, well, one that I worked on a little bit uh, was this gadolinium platinum bismuth. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know what that is, but the point is that its band structure is something from in the simplest perspective, it's like two quadratic touchings where each one of these is a two-fold degeneracy. So it's another type of four-fold crossing. But importantly, this crossing point is at gamma. It can't move around. It actually has a cubic space group and it requires all the different cubic symmetries to kind of protect this, um, to protect this crossing. So these types of crossings are immovable kind of by definition. If they occur at a high symmetry K point, then that high symmetry K point is fixed. There's no way to move them around. Um, and so these things are actually different from the symmetry perspective. And so I want to say a little bit about that. So on the first case, which is when you have band crossings along a high symmetry line, what these really are are crossings between two different types of EREPs. So I'll, you know, I'll say a little bit more what these are EREPs of, but let me just give the, the bigger picture first. So for example, in our Dirac example where we had fourfold symmetry, there is um, one band which has one set of fourfold symmetry eigenvalues, another band which has another set of eigenvalues, and these things cross each other. So the crossing is protected because they have different quantum numbers. In this other case, on the right-hand side, all of these points are part of one EREP. It has some label. I don't remember what the label is. Let's just call it gamma one for now. Um, but they're, they're all part of one EREP, and this is also why uh, there's no way to move this thing. There's no way to move this thing around. It's sitting at one point. It's part of one EREP. There's no, there's no way to slide it. So from a symmetry perspective, these are a little bit different. Um, so now we can answer the question of uh, how, how do you classify band crossings? If you wanted to say, what are all the possible band crossings that I could have in one space group? And then you could go further and say, which one of those are topological band crossings? Um, what's the procedure for doing that? And this is actually a question that we set out to answer um, now several years ago, because at that time, okay, there's vial fermions, there's Dirac fermions. And so we wanted to know what are the other types of fermions that you could have? And so I'm just going to say, um, just kind of outline the procedure for classifying these things. So the first step is that you want to know what K point you're interested in. Um, so if we can only look at high symmetry lines and high symmetry points, then at least for every space group, there's a list of high symmetry lines and high symmetry points. So if we want to classify, we're interested in all of them. 
Um, but for any particular k point, what you need to know is you first need to know what's called uh, the little group at the k point. So the little group at k. So this is usually denoted by gk. And it's the set of all symmetries in your space group that leave that k point invariant. So I'm using little g to mean this is some symmetry in my space group. So maybe it's my fourfold rotation symmetry. Maybe this k point is my high symmetry line, my fourfold symmetry axis. And so if I do fourfold symmetry on that high symmetry line, each point is invariant. So the set of all of those symmetries defines a group. And that group is called the little group at k. You can be a little more technical and say, well, I also want to consider, for example, time reversal and inversion. And so these groups don't always have to be unitary. They can also be anti-unitary groups. But nonetheless, you can, always, you can still classify the EREPs of unitary or anti-unitary groups. So then once I, once I know what that group is, then I want to know what the EREPs are. So that's the second step, um, find EREPs. And hopefully you can look them up in a table because finding these things is not something that you necessarily, not a road that you want to go down. Um, and so every EREP, so I'm sorry, this is um, kind of specific, assuming some uh, knowledge of group theory. EREPs can be 1D, 2D, they have some dimension. Every EREP labels a band at that point, at the K point that we're talking about. So a 1D EREP means you have a non-degenerate band. A 2D EREP means that you have two bands that are crossing, et cetera. And so every EREP, which has a dimension greater than one, corresponds to a band crossing or, or a band touching. So if you want to find all the different possible band touchings that you can have, like, for example, if we're looking at a high symmetry point, then I look at that K point, I find the little group, I look at its EREPs, all the EREPs that have dimension greater than one correspond to a touching point. So this would be an EREP of dimension four um, because there's four bands which are touching at that point. This logic also applies to crossings in a different way. If I have my high symmetry line, um, I, I can also look at a table of EREPs. Now my criterion for having crossing is that I need two distinct EREPs because for the bands to cross, they need to have different symmetry labels. And so there's kind of a different criterion for these two different cases. If I want a band touching at a high symmetry point, I need an EREP with dimension greater than one. If I want a band crossing along a high symmetry line, I need to have two different EREPs. And then it's always possible for those EREPs to cross each other. And that, that, will give me a band, that will give me a band crossing. So this is the general route by which you have a symmetry classification of band crossings or band touchings. Um, so we went through all this logic for all of the space group and all of the high symmetry K points. And so, um, so I can give you the general result for this, which is that the only types of band crossings that you can have are two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, six-dimensional, eight-dimensional. Those are the only possibilities in crystals. There's only a finite number of symmetry groups. Those are the space groups. Um, there's only 230 of them. Each one of them has a certain number of high symmetry K points. So it's just a matter of going through a bunch of lists to figure out these possibilities. So that's, that's the main result. You can have two, three, four, six, or eight-dimensional band touchings. Um, in crystals with, with spin-orbit coupling, just because that's how, that's how we did our classification. And it turns out that these possibilities, 3, 6, and 8, are only possible in non-somorphic space groups. So that's just kind of throwing out some jargon. If you don't know what it means, then you don't have to worry about it. And if you know what it means, then maybe well, you probably already knew this. Um, so these results are, just to write down the reference, so this is a paper, um, this is actually when I first started working with Maya, um, this is a paper by Bradlin et al. Um, from, from 2016. So we outline this classification and make a list of all these. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Let me tie it back, um, let me tie it back to yesterday. I think that one of the most, in oh, question? Good, good, wake everyone up. I, I bored everyone with the symmetry, even though I'm so passionate about it. No, um, I think it's great. I like symmetry. Um, is there 
Do you have any oh. explanation on why these and not others? Like, is there any mathematical so reason I why don't, up to eight? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's a mathematical reason. I think the reason is that there's a finite number of space groups and a finite number of K points, so there had to be a max, and that max is eight. I don't think that there's a better reason than that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So eight is the highest dimensional ERAP of a little group. Yeah. Um, so previously you mentioned that uh, in the systems that had only C2 symmetry, those weren't uh, protected. It's not enough to protect line crossing. Is it, is it basically come down to the same argument that like a C2 group doesn't have, only has one a one dimensional ERAP, so it doesn't satisfy these results, right? Yeah, yeah, ex it, that's exactly it. So what I was actually thinking of was I was, I was thinking of spin-orbit coupling, but I was also thinking of the case where I have time reversal and inversion. So with spin-orbit coupling, the C2 eigenvalues are plus or minus I, but those are time reverse partners, and so they're, they're always degenerate with each other if you have time reversal and inversion. So that's only one ERAP. It's a 2D ERAP, but it just means you have a two um, a doubly degenerate band. And then there's no other ERAP that could cross it because that's the only ERAP that there is because plus or minus I are the only eigenvalues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if you consider magnetic groups yeah. instead of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, space groups, it, it, does it blow up? The, the, great the, question the... since we did that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Also with my, a lot of Maya's help. Um, right. So, the magnetic groups can never have more symmetry than the space. So there's more magnetic groups than there are, oh, okay. that but was they the never have more symmetry. There's just different ways of breaking the symmetry. So, right. so basically what we did was we started with each of these space groups that have, say, an eightfold, and then looked at all the magnetic groups that were subgroups of that and can ask, like, does the eightfold survive? But you can't get any more possibility. I see. So it's really breaking the uh, yeah. touching rather than getting yeah. anything. So, can I ask another one? Yeah, of course. So... Uh, is there a question of how generic these, you know, bent touchings or back crossing are? I, I'll explain mm -hmm. what I mean. So if you if you think about while uh, metal, yeah, right, uh, you argue this way, right? You have a two by two Hamiltonian. Mm. You you need to tune three three parameters mm. in that Hamiltonian to get a, a level, you know, touching mm. crossing. And in the three dimensional brilliant zone, you have three Ks, so you have equal numbers of K to equal num, you know, to to the mm -hmm. uh, dimension mm -hmm. of your Mm -hmm. uh, Hamiltonian, so you can find the bent. Yeah. So, is there uh, any consideration like that uh, for for this uh, classification? Yeah, so you know, it, it's allowed, but it it just never happens because right. you don't have enough so space to find it. Or uh, something like that. that right. So I don't um I don't know if there's it's an ear up of the group. So it, it, right, it's always allowed. I don't know how to make an argument with k points, but you might wonder: is there any orbital in any atom that could realize this? Because these are ereps, but maybe that ereps wouldn't correspond to something possible with atomic orbitals, like it's some weird pseudo vector or something. Um, but for all of these possibilities, it's there's always some orbital. I mean, we we made a model for each of these just. To, because to ask ourselves kind of the same question. So it's always possible to find some orbital that will realize this. Since it's symmetry protected, like the, the argument that you're describing is kind of explaining why vials are possible, actually. They're possible and then they're generic in some sense. These I already know that they're possible. It's an ERP of the group and the symmetry is protecting it. So I, I, I kind of don't need to have that argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right, but they're not fine-tuned precisely because they're symmetry protected. That, that's exactly what it, right, so maybe that's a, a good way to say this. It's an ERAP of the group. So if I had two ERAPs, I could make a fine-tuned Hamiltonian where they would touch each other. But that would be fine-tuned. They could always pass through, and there's just a critical point where they touch. Um, since they're part of one ERAP, it requires no fine-tuning. Every one of these, yeah, so that was the right answer to say every one of these wave functions with all those symmetries has to mix into all these others, and there's no way to break it apart while preserving symmetry. Yeah. Question in the back. Or. Um, for a while, um, the two-by-two two Hamiltonian which you showed, so that is stable to perturbations. What about if we have a higher... Dimensional yeah, so model. these are stable to symmetry preserving perturbations. Thank you. And that's again part of being an ERAP. All of these, 
all of these states transform into each other by symmetry. So there's no way anything that breaks them apart has to break the symmetry. Okay. So is there also like a maximum uh, dimension for the degeneracy of surface states? I mean, this is all bulk touching points, right? Is there some way I can cook up many? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I haven't worked that out. But um, you could do the same thing. So there, you could ask all the 2D wallpaper groups give you the possible symmetries on surfaces of a crystal. So you could do the same thing. And, and this is the same as asking all... So they're always a projection of... Uh, I cannot cook up something where I have like a lot of degeneracies in the bulk in a line and then have like a super high dimension surface state. Ah, uh, so, right. I mean, if you have a bulk... Band. When you have a lot of bulk bands, then that gives you a surface degeneracy that is, I think it's kind of ill-defined. It depends on how thick your sample is. So I guess I'm really thinking of surface okay. states that are um, uh, sitting at a point where you don't have um, bulk states at that energy on the surface. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mean by this uh, four, six, or eight dimensional band touchings in crystal. So, uh, like. Yeah, I'm just saying that, like, my, my vial point, I'm calling that a two, a two band touching because I have a band crossing a band. So, at the crossing point, that's two bands that cross each other. The Dirac point is four because I have a two fold degenerate band crossing another two fold degenerate band. That's a four fold band crossing. So, then you might ask, well, what else? How many other bands can cross at a point? Yeah, so that's what I mean. I'm just saying how many bands are touching at a single point. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, imagine that I have my K point in which I have the fourfold the inertia or whatever, and it's not maximal in the sense that it's connected to a high symmetry point by mm -hmm. aligning with the same little group. Mm -hmm. Then will I, uh, will I be allowed to move the 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 crossing the high dimensional crossing along this line for example right so at these high symmetry points then um the symmetry group on any line coming out of them is less than the symmetry group at that point uh -huh. and so then it's possible for the high symmetry point to break along the line and in fact it I, it always in all of these cases it always does so it didn't necessarily have to be that way but um but it it always is all right thanks. because these ones require so much symmetry yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, just so uh, this is a weird parallel, but uh, in in hydrogen, right, levels are degenerate uh, way more than they need to be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's because there is a, a, this additional conserved vector, this Runge-Gill lens vector, whatever it's called, right? Oh, there yeah. is this accidental degeneracy so hmm. shells with the same end but with different you know angular momenta are oh. degenerate so Sounds like it's it, not required uh, right it, yeah. is there anything like that in this business that you classify it that, you know but then it turns out to be way more degenerate than than you thought so, because um, there's something non-crystallographic going on so to answer that so i could always cook up a fine-tuned model that has extra degeneracies but i think the more relevant question is is there any crystal that has such kind of extra degeneracies Okay. Right. Um, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's many crystals where there's close to such a degeneracy. But I think that the better example is actually spin orbit coupling. So like we, when we made this classification, we wanted to include spin orbit coupling because we had the argument that every material has some spin orbit coupling, whether, you know, be it infinitesimal, it, it can't have strictly zero. So we should classify things with spin orbit coupling. But many materials, graphene, really have effectively zero spin orbit coupling. And so so there are some crossings in materials with non-spin orbit coupling that would be fine-tuned in our language because we always assumed that there was some spin orbit coupling. So I think that's the be most relevant example. So yeah. so th these uh, groups, mm -hmm. they should be really double groups and then... Uh, yeah, exactly. So so I somewhere, yeah, somewhere I wrote, right, I wrote with, with SOC means that they're double groups. Right. You could go through and do the same thing without SOC, um, and then you actually, you do get some different stuff. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, so then maybe I'll just go on and say what I think is the most interesting one of these is um, the thing that I kind of mentioned yesterday, which is called the spin one vial fermion. 
And so, so I mentioned this yesterday, but I'll write it down again. So this is a threefold band crossing. So the Hamiltonian is like very similar to the Weyl Hamiltonian, but now these S's, instead of being Pauli matrices, are the spin one matrices. So there's three of them. So that's why this is a three threefold crossing. Um, and so it kind of looks like this. To linear order, it has, it, to linear order, it looks like a vial point with a band crossing in the middle. But if I added higher order terms, that flat band in the middle will have some dispersion. And in practice, um, it tends to disperse quite quickly for, for some examples that I've seen. And so yesterday, um, so, so we could compute the churn number. Um, so, so yesterday we talked about how we can take a Fermi surface and the Fermi surface will be 2D. Um, and so we can compute the churn number on the Fermi surface. And so we could do the same thing here. And what we would find is that this band, if the Fermi level is up here, the Fermi surface has a churn number of two. Here it's minus two. And in this middle band, it's a churn number of zero. Um, so the consequence of this is that you can have um, double Fermi arcs. And so, you know, yesterday we gave this topological argument for why vial points have a Fermi arc coming out of them. Now, since we have a point which has a churn number of two, it always has to have two Fermi arcs coming out of this. So we came up with some material examples. So I should say that these threefold crossings can only occur in two different space groups. So space group, this doesn't really mean anything, but um, in these two particular space groups. So they're relatively rare. And we have some materials that we found, um, which Maya found actually, which are examples of this. And so the band structures are written, written in our paper. Um, but actually, personally, I think that, um, well, these are kind of difficult examples. And so if you look in the paper and look at the band structure, you'll see what I mean. You look at the threefold crossing and actually the bands are very dispersive. The flat band is very dispersive. Um, it, it's not, it's not nearly as nice as this. So I want to show you a little bit, some, some, some figures now besides me. So, so this is an example. So this left-hand figure is showing the, the threefold crossing that I was just trying to sketch. Um, so this is just kind of a, a better picture of it. This is some toy model that we made. So this is now the surface. I'm looking at the density of states on the surface. This is the projection of one of these spin one vial points. So these are the two Fermi arcs that are coming out of it. This is not a time reversal invariant point. It has a partner over here. So it has two more Fermi arcs coming out of it. And then these are coming from bulk states. There's just some kind of tornado in the middle where the Fermi arcs kind of get merged. Um, and that always has to happen. So, okay, so this is just kind of a nice figure that I've used as a background for lots of talks. Um, but then later there is this prediction that I kind of like. So, so this is the reference, um, but I wanna scroll a little bit so you can see the band structure better. So in this paper, they looked at these, uh, these materials like, um, what are they called? Transition metal silicides. So this is cobalt silicide, rhodium silicide, um, rhodium germanium, and cobalt germanium. Those are the materials that they were, um, that they were thinking of, and these occur, occur in a different space group. So in this paper, they actually did what I was just talking about. They considered these models without spin-orbit coupling. So the classification is a little bit different. Um, and without spin-orbit coupling, you can see at the gamma point, they have this very clear um, three-fold band crossing. And it has the exact same, it has this K dot S Hamiltonian. Um, it has the exact same churn numbers that I was talking about. But actually, each of these bands has a spin degeneracy. So in our language, we'd call it a six-fold crossing. In their language, they call it a three-fold crossing. So it occurs in a different group and it occurs at the gamma point. Because this has a churn number, there needs to be some anti-churn number somewhere else. And so that occurs at the R point. So they showed that at the R point, you have what they call a double vial fermion. It's two vials of the same chirality that are sitting on top of each other. And that can also be symmetry protected in this group. Um, and so then you get this really cool pictures of Fermi arcs, which are that at the gamma point, um, you have, so again, you need to have two Fermi arcs coming out. These are actually two without spin orbit coupling. So they actually have a spin degeneracy. So you have these two Fermi arcs coming out. Um, and then they, they go all the way to the projection of these R points, which is coming from this double vial fermion. So I think this is actually one of the nicest material examples of these, um, of these threefold, 
of these threefold band crossings, and also because they occur pretty near the Fermi level, so um, presumably zero in their calculation corresponds to the Fermi level, and you can see that these are basically right there. So this is actually pretty exciting. This is from, um, from 2017. This is a theory prediction. And then there's been some experimental follow-up on this. Um, the, the work that I know of is by uh, Liang Wu's group at UPenn, where they're using optical measurements to kind of probe these different vial points, um, or, or generalized vial points. Um, Right, so I think that these uh, these spin one vials are actually the most interesting of of these generalized vial fermions or generalized band crossings that actually occur in crystals. And then just to say a little bit more about the six and the eight folds. So basically, the six folds that we predicted are kind of like spin one Dirac's. They're basically two spin ones of opposite chirality that are on top of each other. Um, kind of how I wrote down the Dirac um, Hamiltonian is two vial points that are on top of each other, protected by symmetry. And then the eight folds actually come in a few different varieties. But the only one that has a churn number, and so the only one that's strictly topological in that sense, are these are these threefold band crossings, and that's kind of why I like them so much. So, um, right, that's that's everything that I want to say for today. So, thanks for your attention, and I can take a few more questions. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, for when you go to the first picture you showed where you have your Fermi arcs, which are dissolving somewhat into mm -hmm. your bulk, uh, uh, that <laughs> now, uh, now you made a comment that not all Fermi arcs are topo topologically protected. Ah, so the Fermi arcs that are coming from yeah. Dirac points, which don't have a churn number, those are the ones that are, don't have an argument for their protection. Uh -huh. These ones, since these threefold crossings do have a churn number and they have a churn number of two, these are protected. Okay, then very naive. How can they dissolve into the bulk? Ah, right. So, um, so protected means that, what does protected mean? It means that if I took a 2D slice yeah. that slice would be insulating and it has a churn number of two, so it has to have surface states. What happens in this model is that there's another band crossing in, in, these, in this plane, basically. And so whenever there's a bulk band crossing, there's, you know, there's no churn number associated with it, and the bulk states will also contribute surface states. So, that, so the protection really means if I take, if I look very close to the vial point that I see two Fermi arcs that have to come out infinitesimally close. But if there's any other bulk crossing which is nearby, then they can kind of dissolve into that. Okay. Yeah, which is different than detaching. Yeah, okay. does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so well, thank you very much. Okay. Time for one more question. Yeah. Needed? It's, oh, it's needed. Very important, yeah. Uh, hi, I'd like to uh, see the next picture. Uh, yes, uh, so I think if you leave on one band, then uh, say you uh, leave away from the gamma point, mm -hmm. uh, you have to uh, you have to find some sink to absorb the mm -hmm. uh, two churn number yeah. uh, somewhere else. So is it uh, uh, li like if I'm leaving from the middle band, the churn number zero band mm -hmm. from gamma, and I go to the R point, uh, should there be um, then at our point, I will be uh, I will uh, there will be a, an extra churn number one, right? Yeah, it's actually it's actually a churn number two here because it's two vials that are on top of each other. So that's how it compensates for the original churn number of two. Oh, uh, but 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 if I'm on the middle band, there is no churn number mm. at gamma, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're asking. Um, so. I think what I I don't think we should think about following the churn number of each band individually. Um, the there's a few ways to think about the conservation law. I mean, one is this kind of this idea of um, uh, slicing into energy planes, for example. So um, in this case, if I look at an energy plane which is like uh, um, between gamma and R, and I look at an energy which is between the zero band and the two band, then that will have a churn number of two. And if I follow those planes all the way to the R point, I need to have a churn number of two. And if I follow that gap, then I should see that I have a churn number of two. Um, 
you might say, well, can't I do the same thing for the bottom point? There's a churn number of two, but it seems like it kind of um, like dissolve. Uh, how should I say it? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know a better way to say it. One conservation law is that I maybe I can look at surface states and say that the churn number of two means I have two Fermi arcs. This is also a churn number of two, so I have two Fermi arcs. So it's it's all consistent in that way. You can't really think of it as band by band tracing the churn number, but you can think of Fermi surfaces at a particular energy, and I think then the the conservation law will also work out. Great, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you.